a lot of the principles that I have in my life today were instilled in me as a, a young kid because of my parents. Um, one principle that they lived by, it was the principle of the open door. Like seriously, they, they never locked their doors, ever. Like they were just wide open for anybody to come on in. My wife, on the other hand, she grew up under the principle of Fort Knox. Like her family had everything under tight lock and key. And so there was a clash of our principles when we got married. And so uh, Jenna wanted to get an alarm system as soon as we got married. I thought that that was a waste of money. But of course, happy wife, happy life. And so we uh, got an alarm system. And one night, in the middle of the night, it was like 2 a.m., all of a sudden we were, we were uh, uh, awoken out of our sleep because of this knock on the door. And I turned to Jenna, I'm like, did you hear that? She's like, yeah, I heard that. I'm like, hey, why don't you go check it out? I'm kind of freaked out right now. <laughs> and then we did paper, rock, scissors, I lost. And so I went and checked out, you know, what was going on. And so we come out of my bedroom and it opens up into the kitchen and then it opens up to the living room and, uh, and then you kind of turn down one hallway from there to go to the front door. And so I'm kind of making that, that walk, like tiptoeing across and I get ready to turn the corner to go down the hallway leading to the front door when all of a sudden I see this beam of light like panning the floor. And so I'm now like dropped to the floor, like army man dropped to the floor. I'm in my underpants. I look up and I see this light shining through the windows that flank the door. And so now I'm like army crawling back to my bedroom. I'm like, Psst, get up, call 911. And I'm, I'm army crawling back. And as I get towards the back door, which is like the final breach before I get back to my bedroom, all of a sudden I'm spotlighted. I look up, I lock eyes with this guy. My heart is pounding out of my chest. And it's the Denton sheriff. And he's like, sir, would you please step out of the house? And he's got his hand on the holster of his gun. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm, I'll step out. He goes, hey, uh, do you have any identification on you? We had a, an alarm tripped at this address. And I'm like, I'm in my whitey tidies. I don't have an ID, I'm sorry. Jenna was still so freaked out, she comes, opens the door like three inches, hands me a pair of sweatpants, then shuts the door and locks it again. <laughs> so come to find out what happened is when we got this alarm system, they put this little sensor on the window pad, right? And it, had, it, was, uh, it was just slightly breezy that night. But it must have just blow, been blowing just right that it, that it caused like this slight disturbance, this quite... Slight, uh, slight shudder over that alarm sensor, and so it tripped the alarm. Not even enough to make it audible to Jenna and I, but enough that it tripped and signaled the sheriff to come check out what was going on at our house. Okay, here's the connection point. We have to have an internal alarm system that is sensitive to even the slightest disturbance of our moral principle. It's not enough just to pre-decide to follow godly principles. Because our heart will lead us astray. Remember, our heart is deceptive, and the emotions of our heart, they're really good at tricking us up and, and, and falling for the preference over the principle. That's why most New Year's resolutions are busted by February. So it's not enough just to pre-decide on the principle. We gotta protect the principle. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, this is what it says. It says, above all else, Guard the heart, for everything that you do flows from it. Guard your heart, because every decision that you make flows out of your heart. So we've got to guard our heart, or in other words, we need to pre-decide to protect our principles. Going book, back to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, and, and, and he's calling these people kind of back to the Lord, they didn't end up in this place overnight. No, this happened after years and years, even generations of failing to protect their principles, failing to put this internal alarm system in place when there was a confrontation and, and, a, and a compromise of their principles. See, God actually selected the, the people of Judah as they were part of the nation of Israel as his chosen people. He goes, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm setting you apart for my purpose. You are my holy people, my nation, and I'm going to give you some governing principles so that you look and you act different than your surrounding neighbors. And the other nations may be called to repentance because of the way that you live your life. And that's really what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. If you go back into the book of Deuteronomy, it's all of these principles that God is giving his people to live by. I want to show you two of the principles that, that God gave the Israelites in this context. Deuteronomy chapter 7 Starting in verse 3, it says, Do not intermarry with other nations. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. 
pause on that for just one second. As the overseer of our next-gen ministries, I can attest that this is absolutely true. For girls in high school, as well as our young adult ministry in college, the number one thing that turns them away from God is getting into a relationship with a guy that doesn't love Jesus. Do with it as you may, but that's the facts. Like, I've seen it time and time again. This girl is like red hot on fire for the things of God, and then she dates this guy and then just drops off the map. So God says, hey, I don't want you to intermarry with them. Not that they're, they're wrong, but because you need to influence them, not the other way around. And those that have the closest access to our life actually influence us more than we care to admit. And so he says, here's what you need to do. He says, break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in fire. Okay, in other words, these are two principles that, that God says, I want you to, to live by these. These need to govern your life. These are two out of more than 600, by the way. And at the end of Deuteronomy, in this book, the people go, okay, this is good for us. We subscribe to this. And they say, hey, uh, we're making a covenant or a promise with you, God, to follow these commands. And yet what happens is they compromise. They fail to protect it. I want you to see this. They didn't make the decision to turn away from God overnight. Here's Deuteronomy Here's Jeremiah. That's a lot of pages. 15 books in between Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and a lot of history. And a lot of history of moral compromise. And it started off slowly. It started off with one king taking a foreign wife as a treaty. That mushroomed to him having over 700 foreign wives. I think it's really interesting that in Deuteronomy, it mentions the idol Asherah specifically, which is the exact idol that Jeremiah mentions in his writings as well. Reading between the lines, I think that uh, the people probably rationalized leaving that idol intact. In, in they, they, they were like, okay, well, I know God said like smash, burn, and destroy, like get rid of it. But you know, as long as we just kind of like leave it up, probably not that big of a deal as long as we're not worshiping this thing. And I think therein lies the problem is that our heart loves to rationalize. I've never met one person that wakes up and goes, hey, today's going to be a great day to have an affair. No, they rationalize seemingly small, innocent decisions. A dinner one-on-one with one of their coworkers, followed by a couple of flirtatious texts, followed by some DMs in which they're like, man, I'm in a kind of a rocky place in my marriage right now. Never met one person that goes, hey, you know what my life goal is? To get addicted to pornography. But I've met a ton of people that rationalize it. You know, like, I, I, like it's not that big of a deal. I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody. This is just kind of my thing. Most guys struggle with this. Never have I met one person that decided to gain 15 pounds on Chick-fil-A. Instead, I rationalize it. But it's Christian chicken. Our hearts love to rationalize things. And when we rationalize, it often leads to moral compromise. Stop negotiating with your heart and start leading your heart. We've got to protect our principles. We've got to guard our heart above all else like Proverbs teaches us. Okay, how do we do that practically? We do that by putting some safeguards in place. Safeguards are exactly as they sound. They, they keep you away from the danger zone. You know, nobody falls to their demise off the, the face of a cliff standing 10 feet back. They do it because they're like, I'm going to just kind of you know, dangle my big toe over the edge. We need safeguards in place. But one of the safeguards that I need to put into place this year is I need to, I need to hand my phone to my wife at 4.30 when I get home. I need to power it down and give it to her and say, hey, don't give it back to me until bedtime. Because here's what I've noticed. I'm kind of addicted to this thing. I'll put it down on the table, and then I'll start doing family stuff, and then I'll walk by it, and I'll be like, okay, I wonder if I got a text message. And then I'll respond to a couple of the text messages, and then I'll put it back down, and then I'll pass by it again, and I'll pick it back up, and then I'll check, hey, I wonder if I got any emails, and I didn't get anything good, and I spend five minutes deleting junk mail. And then I might flip and hit Instagram and start scrolling for a minute, all the while communicating to my family that this is more important. I need safeguards. Because I've already pre-decided that I want to be a a present dad and an attentive husband. I want to be present for my boys. I don't want to miss the big moments or the small moments or anything in between. 
I want to be an attentive husband where I recognize the needs of my wife before she even knows it was a need and it's been met. I want to be a present dad and an attentive husband, and so I need safeguards. We all need safeguards. What are a couple of the safeguards that you could put into practice at the start of this year to become the person that you want to become and to lead you into places of greater freedom? I know a a couple of married people that literally, they will not drive in the car one-on-one with a member of the opposite sex. That might seem absolutely absurd to you. That might seem crazy. That might even seem paranoid. It's their safeguard. Here's a safeguard that every single one of us needs in our life. We need community around us. Man, this year, maybe the best safeguard you can put into place is to get plugged into a small group here at Rock Creek. Because the reality is, is inside of that small group, you need to find maybe one to two dudes if you're a guy or one to two girls um, that if you're a girl to to open up and and be authentic with and to give full access to your life. To say, hey, if there's anything out of whack, I want you to speak into my life on that. Because the bottom line is that this faith journey is not one that we're supposed to walk alone. We need each other. We need community. Get plugged into a group. Allow that to be a safeguard for you this year. We need safeguards. Safeguards are really, really wise, but they're not bulletproof. And in fact, in my experience, safeguards, when used in isolation, nearly always fail. They've always failed me. In fact, the only time that I've seen a safeguard be effective is when it's coupled with this one key principle. It's the one key principle that Jeremiah was actually trying to draw the people of Judah back to. It's the one key principle that we actually see echoed from Old Testament to New Testament. It's the one key principle that Jesus references when these religious leaders come to him and they start quizzing him. They go, hey, out of all the 600 commands in the Old Testament, which by the way, that's a lot of principles to prioritize and a lot of principles to protect. And so they were trying to distill it down because they knew they couldn't keep them all. So they're like, hey, which of those principles is paramount? And without blinking an eye, Jesus in Matthew 22, he goes, it's it's simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest principle. We could coin this the principle of the first. This is what Jeremiah was calling the people back to, to first love. It's what Jesus is inviting us into this year, first love. Man, if you want 2023 to be a banner year, you need to pre-decide to follow the principle of first. 